Welcome to Six Pack Philosophy, where we take philosophy, mix it with beer, and apply it to the questions you deal with every day. Welcome to Six Pack Philosophy. I'm Anastasia here with Mike and John, and this week we are establishing our absolute reign over the podcast realm. With our discussion of absolutism. That was good. Thank yeah. you. That was really good. But before we get started, what are we drinking, guys? We are drinking Shiny Diamonds Ale. Ooh, from, I got the fuzzy ones. From the Independence Brewing Company in Austin, Texas. This is a, what, 5% ABV? 5%. And for those of our fans who have requested it of <laughs> us... What the fuck? Um, <laughs> it's, it's not working over here for the mistress. But for those of our fans who have requested it of us and uh, maybe have your it's hopes up... It's a glitter up, beer. I don't. Is it? I don't no. think it is. Yeah, this is not a good beer. Why is this not pouring? It's pouring like a fucking child. Here, let me show you. It's I think like it's the this. person that's running it there. Yeah. Shut up. Look. Boom. All Boom. right. So while y'all are fizzy, while y'all are pouring that up, uh, we are doing absolutism, uh, particularly the form of absolutism dealing with absolute monarchs, uh, absolute despotism. Uh, if you want to hear more about this, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. Is that, that down below us here? or uh, It's below. It's kind of all yeah, around. Yeah, just wherever. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. We, uh, get a chance to, to watch us do this all the time. Subscribe to your podcatcher. And, uh, Anywhere you see the six-pack logo and a subscribe button, click it. Click it. Yeah. We want to be like all up in your we shit. Do, we do. And, and, and that's going to get you more episodes. If you want to know more about this episode, maybe there's something we don't cover as well or you want to take a little bit of a deeper dive, you can go to sixpackphilosophy.com and you'll get a little pop-up to subscribe to our newsletter. And we send out show notes. We send out other stuff going on on the website. So so that'll be a deeper dive into this episode. Sometimes you get quizzes. You never know what you'll get on that on that newsletter. Uh, it's, it's kind of new to us, but we're, we're it's growing quick. So, All right. So absolutism. We are going to talk a little bit about uh, what it means to be an absolute monarch and kind of the guiding question as I go through this. And, and, and this is going to be a little more history heavy uh, because this is one of my episodes. So that's kind of how, how it works. But the guiding question that I want to kind of think about as we're going through this is what is the value or is there a value of absolutism in government okay of of, of one person having all the authority does if it, it's me then yes let me ask and maybe i'm skipping ahead here but when we talk about absolutism are we restricting it to only a person or could it be like an organization or a small group of people i i've i have 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 restricted it to an absolute monarch here so 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 one person or a royal family yeah uh but 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 yeah you you can you can have absolutism in a party um it, it's a little harder to do yeah uh, uh and, and I, I like think that'll be clear order. as we go through the new world order yeah george 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 uh, h w bush's new world order yeah. The, yeah the lizard people the lizard people all right so when you hear absolute monarch what what comes to your mind absolute monarch it's a I'm sorry. Beheadings. Beheadings. Um, okay. Sometimes. But but a a system of government in which, for one reason or another, people put absolute power and faith into, uh, like you said, a family or a person, um, uh, and and the reasons, like I said, they, they vary across yeah. the scale. Yeah. Generally speaking, uh, when we talk about absolutism, we, we talk about. Where ultimate authority to run a state is vested in the hands of a king or or a royal family, usually by divine right, uh, not always, but but generally speaking, it, it, it's by divine right. Uh, so, kind of kind of get these these terms. We've we've used the word divine right before, and that's just the belief that uh, that a, a king is granted their authority by God. They the reason they're in power is because they are God's emissary on earth mm -hmm. and that's going to be kind of where we're going to going to start here with this stuff and and look at the justification of this C can you imagine any reason why uh, a divine right monarch would be supported by by people um fear of danger okay um fear of not only fear Pro of yeah, promise of safety yeah not only fear of outside danger but also fear of standing up to them it may, it may not even be directly supported so much as not spoken against you know I, I this has been the dominant feature in history for for most of our history now today there uh most people say there are no real divine right monarchs left there there are people that, that claim it but there's no no system where the the people seem to believe that anymore mm -hmm. um well, 
What about North Korea? Well, North Korea is not really a divine. I mean, the, their their leader took power through military coup, so it's not really a divine right kind of thing. Uh, yeah, but they think that he doesn't poop. Well, I don't think or, they. I don't think they think that. I think he claims it. You know, uh, I, I I could be wrong, and everything I've read is kind of kind of says that this person, and even there, he doesn't have absolute power. He, yeah. he he's checked. Uh, he he has some limits on his check. He's one of those ones that came to power because of because of parties more than he did because of uh, at least his family did. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's it's a, it's a little bit different than than the divine right. There's a guy named Bishop Jacques Binet Boussoy. Uh, Frenchman, obviously. Uh, say that three times fast. I, I, I can't say it twice fast. <laughs> Bishop Boussoy was a uh, was a high ranking member in the Catholic Church in France, and he's the first person to use that term "divine right." And he suggested that uh, for a government to be, be effective or efficient, their leader must be chosen by God. He said that uh, that that if your government is not ordained by God, then humanity can't live in an organized society. And that kind of seems to be uh, the, the belief that, that most nations had at this time. And I think there's a degree of comfort to that. Uh, you know, we talk about, about what, what is the value of this. I think if you're in a heavily uh, religious society, there has to be a degree of comfort in believing mm-hmm. that your leader was selected by God. Yeah. Yeah. And that that's going to be be something that 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 uh, kings and queens are going to utilize uh, greatly, because I, even beyond just just the comfort of of the people, think about the comfort of the king to be able to say, "You can't argue with me," because to argue with me is to argue with God. Mm-hmm. And we've got all these the, 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 these these. Uh, powerful, great kings, and when I use great here, I mean uh, I, I don't mean great as in good. I mean great as in all encompassing. Right. These powerful, great kings that wh- whose power was was unconditional. They came to power with this this uh, this idea of being able to dominate everything. Uh, now, sometimes that they they ended up end up dividing their 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 empires up into into fiefdoms. Okay, uh, little. Little small kingdoms with nobles over them, but they always have to remain the ultimate authority for it to be uh, absolute monarchy. So you can have degrees, you can have separations, but ultimately they are the ones that set the agenda and they are the ones that that, that make the ultimate choices. Um, so the the first guy I want to talk about is King Philip II of Spain. Uh, y'all, y'all are y'all familiar with Philip II? Mm-hmm. I bet you are, whether you realize it or not. Philip II was, uh, they called him the Catholic King. He was the leader of Spain. He was married to, to, to Mary, Mary I, Queen Mary of England. Uh, he never became King of England. He was King of Spain. She was Queen of England, but they were married to each other. Um, if you don't know who that is, that's, that's Bloody Mary of history. Uh-huh. Uh, called that because She's the one who shows up in the mirror, right? Uh, well, maybe. She, she, she's, <laughs> okay. she was called Bloody Mary because she had a habit of using Protestants as tiki torches, uh, lighting them on fire. So uh, she's the one that brought Catholicism back when her, you know, her father, Henry VIII, is the one that, that, that took England to Protestantism. Uh, and when she comes back to power, she takes it back to Catholicism and burns the Protestants. Well, when Mary dies, there, there, there's fear of what's going to happen. So Philip II, what, what, what am I going to do? What, uh, you know, I, I, I can't I, – his goal is to spread Catholicism. He was a devout Catholic. Uh, above all else, he was a devout Catholic. And Philip II proposed to Mary's sister, Elizabeth, before Mary even died uh, because he was afraid of, of, of losing this. Elizabeth mm-hmm. was a Protestant. When, uh, when, Elizabeth, uh, when Elizabeth turned him down, she, she refused to marry him uh, – Saying that 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 England is my is my spouse. England is my husband. Uh, he he does what what any rational person would do. He invaded England or tried to. This is the Spanish Armada king. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I love the story that you know. Under Philip II, Spain became the dominant naval power in the world. They built the largest navy the world had ever seen. By the way, that remained the largest navy the world had ever seen all the way up until the First World War. Mm-hmm. It was massive. Uh, and he sent it across the English Channel. He was a uh, from France crossing there, 
and a, a storm came up, and, and what really defeated the Spanish Armada was this storm. It racked the ships. It destroyed them, so very few reached England. And uh, I love the way Elizabeth says it because she becomes this dominant queen of England when she says that God selected me because God sent a Protestant wind to stop the Catholic invasion. Um, <laughs> I, I didn't I, mean to roll my eyes so hard there. I kind of like it. I, I kind of like the idea of that. But this is the guy that turned Spain into the first modern European power. Um, oh, hold on. Were there Protestant winds and Catholic winds and maybe heathen winds? Well, I think Elizabeth was using a metaphor there to say, look, we are a Protestant nation. Mm -hmm. The Catholics were coming, and God crushed the Catholic mm -hmm. fleet. It, he, she used that as evidence that God was a Protestant. Mm -hmm. If God had been a Catholic, he wouldn't have done that. Of He'd have course. put the wind against them and brought them to them. Uh, yeah. So uh, that, 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 that's interesting, at least, to me. It's, it's always interesting to me. <clears throat> and you can trace this back through most religions that still exist today. When a historically new religion claims that God is one of them, whenever the religion very clearly throughout history wasn't around when the God they worship uh, was supposedly around. Well, you, you know, you, they finally found the true religion and God had, 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 had rewarded them for it. Don't you understand yeah. these things? Absolutely, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, but... Uh, the reason Philip is able to do all this is because of, uh, well, he, he would have argued that it was God, but it was real, really capitalizing on the wealth of the Age of Exploration, which is going on at the same time period. Mm -hmm. Spain was the, you know, the dominant country to reach the Americas, and they brought back shiploads of, uh, of gold and silver and, and, and other precious uh, items from the Americas. And this mercantilist system that they had there um, is what fueled this growth, but instead of taking that money and putting them putting it into uh, economic growth inside the empire, he funneled that money into a military war machine. As we've seen, mm -hmm. excuse me, as we've seen many of these uh, um, uh, divine right kings do. Uh, he, he tried to invade England. He failed there. But he did. He does manage to capture Portugal. He does manage to capture the Netherlands, the Spanish Netherlands. Uh, and, and Spain is, at, at the height of his power, is the most powerful country the world had ever seen. You know, it was, it, it, it was up there with Rome mm -hmm. at, at its height. Uh, I, I would argue that it's probably, probably even larger. Um, now, because he was a divine right king... He's going to use his absolutism to change Spain dramatically because Spain is one of those countries that had been settled heavily by uh, Muslims, by, uh, by, by Jews, by Protestants. These different groups had all settled there. And this is the king that, that puts the Spanish Inquisition into place. Mm -hmm. uh, and he uses the Spanish Inquisition as a tool of the government. So he's using the Catholic Church as a tool of the government to punish his his enemies, and he actually either you know by by order evicts all of the Muslims, all of the Jews, uh, and all of the Protestants from the Spanish territories. It becomes a crime mm -hmm. to be one of those uh, be, be a member of that faith. Now, do I, do I think they really evicted all of them? No, a lot of them went underground and practiced, right. but. It, it became a crime uh, punishable by death to do this. And I think that makes sense if you think about a divine <coughs> right king. Um, so this is the guy that expands the, the not only Spain, but he ex expands Catholicism during this time period throughout Europe with, with the Spanish influence. So much so that Europe gets the name, instead of just calling it Europe, the, the continent, they called it Christendom because it was this one... Uh, a uh, body of, of, of believers uh, with one basic Christian faith that, that, that had, had gone over everything. Now, there was Protestant and Catholic, but there was still one Christian idea and largely dominated by, by the king of Spain and, and, and the pope. Uh, how powerful was this guy? This guy was so powerful that he got his own people elected by the cardinals uh, to, a, a, as pope. Uh, he manages to, 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 to hand-select the pope during his time period. Oh, wow. Uh, which is it, it's pretty amazing when you think about it. Yeah. When you've got your own puppet there that is saying that everything you're doing is right, it, it makes it makes it easier to be a, oh, yeah. a divine right king. Uh, 
interestingly enough that uh while this person uh was the one that that um uh governed spain during the height of its power he's also the one by the end of his term that sees the end of spain as a world power uh he's going to bankrupt the nation uh the the loss to to england is going to greatly damage him and uh we're never going to see Spain as that that giant power again after him. So, this guy, as an absolute leader, uh, what w- w- would you call him effective and efficient? I, I, effective I, at what? Well, yeah, I mean, is the- I, well, I, 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 I'm, I'm thinking about in terms of of the state. Was he effective in running the state? Well, I think if within his own lifetime, he was able to build it up and crash it, then I would say no. Yep. Effective for a time, but uh, well, and and you know that that's really one of the questions you get into with this is if you ask, was he effective at protecting his own interests? He it seems largely he was. Now, if you ask, was he effective at protecting the interests of his nation, of his people? Uh, the bankruptcy, I think it's a lends itself to the idea that maybe he wasn't so much. Mm-hmm. I think uh, I, I, I think you have a hard time arguing against his efficiency. He seemed to be very efficient. Mm-hmm. He, things got done done quickly. And I think you can argue that for most of his term, he was effective because for most of it, Spain <laughs> is, 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 is wealthy, it's powerful, it builds a giant navy. Uh, but... but uh, which is an argument for absolutism, but the other side is the the other side of the coin of efficiency is if you're efficient at making good choices, you're also efficient at making poor choices. Yeah, yeah. well, and that's the thing that kind of occurred to me with this whole divine right idea is that if your authority comes directly from God, it seems like that sort of idea would would um cause you to not second guess anything that you did if you had an idea that you should uh you know rape your sister's husband then you know god put that idea in your head and you should absolutely do it if god said that you should raid every country that touches you and all the countries that touches touch them then that was an an idea put into your head by god who gave you this this authority God wouldn't have put that idea in your head and wouldn't have given you the authority that gave you the power to do that if that's not what God actually wanted you to do. Okay. And it, it seems dangerous. I, I, I think dangerous is a good term for it. Um, uh, but, but again, I think, I think efficient is a, it, it, it is a, it's a term for it, too. There, yeah. there seems to be a, a high degree of efficiency to it. Yeah. That. Well, if, if, if by efficiency we're describing the ability to get things done 100%. When there is one person who, when they get a wild hair up their ass about any one thing, can just use all of the power of a, a government to do the thing that it is that they want to do, that is incredibly efficient. Yeah, when yeah. you've got to go through 535 plus a few uh, people to get something done, I mean, you're going to be able to do a lot. Five hundred thirty-five plus a few, so yeah. four thirty-five in the House, a hundred in the Senate, and then those little territorial guys that get to talk. Well, no, I was actually referring to like the president, the oh, vice okay. president, and like anybody advising him on this. I was things. trying to figure out who the, who the few <laughs> were. Uh, I was like, okay, I got the five thirty-five. Who's the few? Okay, yeah. gotcha. gotcha. And then the Supreme Court, if you yeah. get to that whole thing, okay. so okay. a few more, a few more, five thirty-five <laughs> and a few. Uh, yeah. A few million citizens who may be unhappy about it. Oh, like yeah, that matters. Shh, citizens. All right. That doesn't matter until the election, and then it only barely matters. <laughs> and you get a choice between two of the same person. Wow, I am feeling cynical today. I'm telling you. Okay. <laughs> it, I'm just saying. 1876, <coughs> it mattered. 17? 17. So, yeah, 1876, yeah, nobody cared. Year, yeah. Nobody, nobody cared, cared <laughs> yeah. in the centennial. You're right. Yeah. All right. Uh, so then we got, so we've, seen, we've seen what's going on in Spain. In France, we had we also had a Catholic king, but it's a little different. Uh, the 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 French kings were a little um, a little less religious. They're not really about spreading the faith. France has always been a little less religious. Yeah, than it, the rest it, of well, it was it definitely seems. a Catholic nation. The yeah. people were very Catholic, but the kings were. 
uh, nominally Catholic. They were Catholic in name only. You know, they were. Um, I think the kings of, of, of France tended to be be more about uh, what's what's good for me. Yeah. Uh, and and we're going to start off with Louis XIII. Louis the Thirteenth was uh, he was a teenager when he became became king. Uh, you, your head would roll if you knew how uncatholic these guys really were. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. Louis the Thirteenth though is just a boy when he becomes king of England. Uh, I'm sorry, king of France. And because he's he, he's not of age. You've got this weird situation where he was the divine right ruler and the absolute ruler on paper. Mm-hmm. But in reality, the Catholic Church under Cardinal Richelieu kind of ran things. Uh, cardinal Richelieu was uh, not only a cardinal in the Catholic Church, but he was the preeminent advisor to the king. Um, that seems like the spot to have. Well, no. Uh, you, it, it, he, he, he's pretty effective and efficient at it, yeah. Uh, but Richelieu comes in, and um, he exercises that power for the king. So he's mm-hmm. kind of the king in the place of the king. Uh, he executes a bunch of nobles that, that, that questioned whether or not a boy should be king. Uh, uh, and, and Louis XIII never really comes out of, uh, out of Richelieu's shadow. Mm-hmm. But his son, Louis XIV, does. When Louis the Fourteenth comes to power, Richelieu tries to control him the same way, and 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 he's not having any of that. He he keeps Richelieu there as a way to control the church. But there's where uh. the p- power dynamics shift. Richelieu is not the dominant feature under Louis the Fourteenth. Richelieu is 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 Louis the Fourteenth's tool for controlling the church. Um, Louis the Fourteenth is uh it, it is quoted as 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 saying uh. L'état c'est moi, uh, I am the state. Mm-hmm. And what he meant by that was, was I am the ultimate authority, whatever I say go, it goes. To the point that there's a quote from him where he instructs his nobles, uh, I order you not to sign anything, not even a passport. Everything comes through the king. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you see any issues with that? It would seem actually inefficient. It becomes it becomes incredibly inefficient because he's unwilling to use those fiefdoms mm-hmm. so much so that he took a uh, he inherited this this little hunting palace or little hunting lodge uh, at a place called Versailles and he took that hunting lodge and built the most lavish palace the world had ever seen. Uh, have you ever seen pictures of the Palace of Versailles? It's gilded in gold. It's one of the most amazing places you'll ever see. So a literally solid gold table Yeah, yeah. in there. But what's amazing oh, about it is is the reason he built this so large, because if you ever go to it, and I, I went years ago when I was a young Marine thinking to myself, how could one person need something this large? He didn't build it for one person. He ordered the nobles to, to leave their 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 communities mm-hmm. and come to the palace. And they lived in the palace, and they mm-hmm. lived in the area around it. And they had to be there at court every day because this is the way he controlled them. He was worried about uh, about the nobilities rising up and having a degree of power if they stayed in their, uh, in their areas, in their community. So we're going to consolidate them all in one area. And when they ask him why, he says, because I am the sun king. And when they asked him what that meant, he said, uh, said, I'm the sun king because everything revolves around me and I provide light to the kingdom. Um, and, and that tells you something about the way Louis XIV saw the world. For the sun king, it doesn't seem too bright. But, you know. uh, well, it, it, it worked. It worked in, incredibly well for him. Um, now, I, I will say that he, he liked war a lot. Um, they all seem to. A lot of them did. Um, it's really easy to like war from a throne room. Uh, it, it is. Uh, we'll see one that likes it from, from the battlefield in a little while. <coughs> but Louis XIV, uh, you know, he, he's the guy that, 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 that goes through and he ends up going to war against his cousin in Spain. And, uh, you know, all the Bourbon kings are fighting over this stuff. Mm. Um, That's sad. I, I, maybe, maybe, but it also keeps one, one nation from, you know, there, there's a reason for this. It keeps one nation from dominating everything if, the, if, if, if there's a family argument here. Um, I'm just saying a bourbon bourbon shouldn't be a fight and drink. <laughs> so Louis the Fourteenth, with his centralized power, he comes through and he says uh, that he needs to feed this lifestyle. It, it, everything is so lavish that the only way to feed it is through war. Mm-hmm. So he starts invading his neighbors, and in fact, he has the opposite effect. Excuse me. Um, 
much like we saw with, with, with Philip, his wars are ultimately going to bankrupt the nation. Yeah. Are, are you trying to say, because I don't know if I can believe this, that war doesn't add real world, real value to an economy? It only boosts the perceived value because of the weapons you have to produce? So, something like like broken windows? Is that, are, are, I'm thinking of broken windows. Why am I thinking I of that? Because you break windows... When you go to war, yes. Yeah, so, yeah. so, so then somebody yeah. has to replace Arms the windows. The glazier's yeah. fallacy, yeah. like, like uh, General Frederick Bastier did, yeah. said. <laughs> yeah. So uh, he, he he ends up bankrupting his country, and we're going to end up with a situation where uh, the king and his family control everything. You end up with the third, the, the, the three estates in France. Uh, the first estate's the clergy. The second st- estate is the nobility, and the third estate is. We, are, we usually say the bourgeoisie, but it's everyone else, okay? Yeah. The third estate is 97% of the people, okay? 97% of the people are in the third estate, and the third estate is going to have enough. They're going to decide that they're tired of dying for their king. They're going to they're gonna, they're, they're gonna decide that they're tired of starving while their king is living this lavish lifestyle. Wait, and a bunch of whiners. The bourgeoisie? And the bourgeois, well, the bourgeoisie is the middle class of it, oh, okay. but 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 but... But it, it includes everybody. Okay. Uh, it, it's the middle class that's going to it's going to run it when this happens. Uh, now it's not going to happen in Louis the Fourteenth's term, but Louis the Fourteenth is going to be responsible. He's going to be the person directly responsible for the birth of uh, of the French Revolution and the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment's growth. Um, so while France took the torch from Spain and became the most powerful country during this time period. Again, by the end of this absolutism and this absolute leader, they're showing the signs of breaking, Uh, which again is an example of it's very effective, it's very efficient for growth, but it's at some point uh, growing through deficit spending is not going to work anymore. It's crazy. I know. It doesn't make any sense. No, it doesn't. Um, So we've kind of looked at – well, I've got one more guy I want to talk to you about in Russia – Peter the Great, who is one of the most interesting people in all of history to me. Um, I love these guys that name themselves, you know, Peter the Great. Uh, Peter uh, is part of the Romanov dynasty of Russia, and he you really wouldn't have thought he would have, would have done much. Uh, he was the third kid of the, of, of, of the, of the Tsar of Russia. Uh, he wasn't ever expected to do anything. He had an older sister that was uh, considerably older than him and very wily politically. Uh, he had a, a twin brother that was, most historians believe he had, a, he, he was mentally incapable. Uh, you know, he had he had mental issues. Um, he was slow, as we would say sometimes. And then there was Peter. And, um, you know, you got to pass the pass the sister over because sister can't vagina. Could, sister can't because she has a vagina. Yeah. So what ends up happening is they crown both brothers as co leaders of of Russia, but the older sister who is significantly older. This you know Peter the Great is 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 and his brother are ten years old when this happens. Uh, so the older sister starts running things, mm-hmm. and she is. Abusive to them. In fact, there's a there's a throne that you can see. It's it's got uh, it's got two seats on it where the two boys would sit, and there was a door behind it that you could slide. And legend has it that the sister would sit behind there and whisper to the boys what to say. Um, eventually, she's nice. gonna she's gonna get tired of being in the background, and she's just gonna push the boys off and kind of more or less let let less imprison them and start acting as the leader themselves. And the Russian people were okay because she's a placekeeper. Um, the 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 uh, the slower the two brothers and I can't remember his name he he doesn't put up any fight at all he just kind of lets her do what he wants to and to keep Peter happy and and, and content she lets him go play his games now he plays games like I, I would have loved to have been Peter at this time they uh, she gives him a a a, a, a mili- real military weapons and peasants and these peasants are his private soldiers they're ch- it's a children army and they have cannons and they build ships and they go out and they play war with real guns and stuff he's he's commanding these people and building they kill forts. people and it, well they, yeah they would shoot each other uh, he, he would order his people to do this stuff so he was learning to do this entertaining himself through this this play war and learning to be a general as a boy that's like serial killer psycho shit yeah he was a little crazy um and uh 
you know, eventually Peter comes of age and he challenges his sister because she makes the fatal error of naming herself Tsarina. Uh, the first, you know, she just calls herself that. She's not granted the title by the mm-hmm. boyers. She's not, there's no legal, right? she just takes that title. And that's when Peter has enough. And he convinces his brother, uh, you know, who, who kind of sways with whoever talks to him. And they end up overthrowing his sister. She gets thrown into a, uh, she gets put into a nunnery where she spends the rest of her life uh, imprisoned as a nun. Um, and Peter, Peter, as a teenager, now comes to power. Um now, what I like about, about, about Peter the Great here is uh, he has this council of boyars that supported him in overthrowing his sister, so he trusted them, and he leaves his boyars in charge, and he says, I want to see the world. T- two things. Yeah. One, I, I think it's hilarious, the difference in culture from then to now and how serious these guys took themselves, because they named themselves Peter the Great. I, th- I think if, if it was in this day and age... It would be like, you know, a few Peters the he'll do or <laughs> Peters is good enough. The other thing that, that that I imagine is is, you know, one of his his nobles leaving during the, the period when his, his sister gets sent to the, yep, the, the, the nunnery, nunnery and come back and say, Where's your sister going? None of your business. <laughs> <laughs> None you. Yeah. Uh, oh my god. So that was terrible. <laughs> so both awful. We are. So Peter goes off to see the world, and he does something that no Russian had ever done before. Russia had always looked east, and if you look at the, this time period, Russia was a very Asiatic country, uh, much more akin to Mongolia and China mm-hmm. than Europe. Well, he looks west, mm-hmm. and he ends up taking a group of his people, and he, he goes through, and he goes through Poland and France and Germany and, he, and, and, and England, and in all these places, he, he, he studies – and one of the things that, that, that he allegedly did was he, he pretended not to be the czar. Now, nobody thinks that they didn't know he was the czar, mm-hmm. but he just called himself so Peter the Carpenter. And he went through and he learned uh, – in England, he learned how to build ships, mm-hmm. and he actually worked – with the English Navy, he was so that the, the king showed him this, and he built ships with them and worked with his hands and learned how to do all this. Um, apparently, he wasn't a very good house guest. The king had, had convinced a nobleman to to give him his 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 house to live in while he's there, and uh, Peter and his people would would get drunk and 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 shoot holes in the pictures and all kinds of stuff oh, while they shoot? were shoot holes in the shoot. pictures. Yeah, yeah, they would they got very violent. There's a, there's a story about him shooting a cannonball through the through the door of the house cuz he wanted to see what it would do. You know, Peter just well, kind of When you give a child an army and weapons for fun, what the fuck do you think they're going to do as I, an adult? I'm just saying that I I wish I'd had an army, but I, I know young, you do. But, uh, you know, but so And I think you would have done that sort of shit if you'd had one. Absolutely, I would exactly. have. I would I would have been a, been a very very bad person. But while he's out there, he in, in Europe, he sees that Europe has going, undergone something that, that Russia hasn't. Europe went through the Renaissance while Russia did not. Right. Europe, uh, Europe is very modern, while Russia was the equivalent of, like, Europe in the 12th century. Mm-hmm. It, was, it was very, very backwards. So he comes back and he brings these ideas with him. And he forces the people – this is him uh, – First off, he hears a, he hears a or gets a message that the boyers are starting to exercise control without him. So he cuts his trip short. He goes back, uh, leads his army in, overthrows the boyers, puts himself back in power, and he orders the people of Russia to westernize, to the point that they have to change their clothes. Uh, they have to cut their beard. He puts, first, he puts a beard tax. If you wanted to grow it to raise money, you wanted to grow that Russian style beard, you had to pay a tax. Uh, when that doesn't work, he just orders his people to do it. Uh, the, he has the secret police that would, would grab you and shave you. You have to be shave, <laughs> clean shaven because that's the Western way of doing things. It would be so cold. Um, so, and, and, and Western clothes don't work well in right. Russia, really. But he wants to be taken serious by the world. And Europe did not take them serious when they looked like Asians. Mm-hmm. Um, so he, he he's looking he's looking westward and wanting to change all this stuff. I want to um, just interject real quick that yeah. this motherfucker, after like he's imprisoned, but I guess not well imprisoned. He's kept. Yeah, and his sister. He it sounds like he got mad that his sister took the title. Yeah, and then sent her away 
and rather than doing the fucking job said i didn't really want it i just didn't like her having it and then left yeah i don't see it that way i really i really see it as uh at least on this part i like what peter did okay. he looked around and he said we are behind we are economically bad why are we this way let me go see okay and he went and and, and, and he, he did the work okay now i think it was an adventure for him i don't i don't at all think it wasn't an adventure but he did he did study governments he did mm-hmm. talk to philosophers he did do all of this stuff and he was one of the first first um, um, dictators to study philosophy. Mm-hmm. He See, wanted I didn't to know understand yeah. that was the purpose for him leaving. Yeah, well, well yeah, uh, yeah. Well, that was his stated purpose. I really fine. think it was it was adventure more than anything else. Mm-hmm. But because that's that's how he was raised. But he comes back um, and 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 he actually puts this European style government on top of 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 uh, uh, on top of Russia. He gets himself crowned divine right. By the Eastern Orthodox Church, mm-hmm. uh, he's now uh, kind of modeling himself after this European absolute monarch. Uh, pretty effective. He expands Russia more than anybody else did. Uh, he, he he takes Russia all the way to the Pacific Ocean and even colonizes the Americas. I mean, he he puts colonies in in Alaska and, and colonies in California for a little mm-hmm. while. Peter the Great is is you know he's he's remembered in Russia. As this uh, as as this great expander, he also increased the rights of of serfs. Now they're still serfs, right? He didn't abolish serfdom. That's going to happen later on, but he's going to increase their rights, and people gen- genuinely loved him. Um, his brother does die kind of mysteriously, but. Um, he, he, he's, he's, he wants to get the Black Sea. He's not able to do that. He tries. Uh, that would have been, been absolutely essential. But he, uh, he, he, does do, he does do a lot. And still to, the, to this day, Peter the Great is remembered as the greatest leader Russia ever had. He mm-hmm. took them out of the Dark Ages and into the Enlightenment. Mm-hmm. Um, this is a good place to stop and talk about this beer so we can get into the next section uh, of absolutism, where we're going to talk about where absolutism becomes enlightened despotism. Okay, so uh, who wants to start talking about this beer? I'll go ahead. Um, you know, I was about to tell you as as much as I am enjoying the history here and learning about this great Peter. Um, <laughs> I uh, I do I do have some. We need to talk about the beer. Um, whenever you first drink this beer. It hits your palate in a slightly sour manner. I was actually a little bit taken aback. I was like, is it sour? And then it mellows out very quickly and dramatically. And you start to get some bitter flavors come in there. And the combination of those two excuse me, uh, kind of leads to a crisp, uh, uh, wild fruit flavor. Anyone who's, who's grown up in the South around fruit trees knows that the stuff you normally buy in the store is much sweeter yeah. than the their original counterparts. It, it's a little more sour. And then that kind of fades out, and you're left with almost a water taste on the back end. Um, the, this beer is, is definitely not going to be my favorite. I don't know um, what they were going for here or if, if, it's, if it's parsing me. Uh, that that said, I'm I'm, I'm giving this 2.0. I'm I'm clearly drinking through it. I, I don't think it's disgusting. 2.0. Yeah. Okay. But I, I'm not I'm not really a big fan. Okay. You want to go ahead? Sure. Uh, I I I don't think it's a good beer. No. Um. I I I don't think it's a terrible beer. I right. could drink it, but it's not a good beer. It's uh, I don't like a fruity beer, and this has got just the fruit in it, fruit in it seems um. It doesn't seem Underripe. necessary. Yeah, there you go. And, and it doesn't yeah. seem like it's really part of it. It's, yeah. it's it's like it was just thrown in there to give it something different. It's also a very, very thin beer, um, mm-hmm. which I mean, almost watery. Um, I, I'm not sure where this beer fits as to when I would drink it. Uh, I I think a, I think a two o is is a little high actually. Uh, not a lot high, but a little bit high. I'm going to go 1-8. Mm-hmm. Okay. Wow. I knew I was going to torpedo this beer. I didn't realize it was going to be that bad. Um, the aftertaste on this beer, to me, tastes the way that glue smells. And I don't <laughs> like it. Like Elmer's glue or like... Like Elmer's like glue. Like chemically, like super glue-ish. Maybe like a... 
Yeah, Elmer's a little bit. Okay. Um, one of the so I've written down a few notes about the beer, and one of the first notes that I wrote down was chlorine because I can yeah. see that. Yeah. yeah. Um, which was primarily in the smell of it, especially when it had more of a head on it, but it was aggressive. And I've been force forcing myself to drink this beer to try to find something good to say about it. And I don't fucking like it. Um, it it's bitter in a way that something that's gone bad is bitter. Yeah. It's uh, sour in a way that unripened fruit is sour. Yep. Um, and I don't like it. It gets a point nine from me. Point nine? You have no taste. Mary John. Guys, there's a producer trying to tell us to be quiet. When you're ready. It's recording. Oh, All okay. right. Good. <laughs> I was trying to give you some silence. So anyway, um, as I was saying earlier, by the way, we had some technical issues. Yeah, but we're back now. Apparently, hard drive space is not an unlimited resource. Uh Yeah. Yeah. If you were uh, watching the live stream, though, you got to hear a... A um, A lot of shit. Enthralling conversation about... I wouldn't call it that. It was pretty bad. Yeah. It was was terrible. About... uh, Like this beer. My calculus class about uh, molecules and about... Mike, being an asshole. Sex with midgets. Um, all right. No, we missed that so, part. So that was last time. What was your beer? So ready? anyway, um, I gave the beer a point nine because it's a shit beer. Um, as I said apparently to nobody earlier, um, because the recording had stopped, I get notes of glue and chlorine. Um, chlorine primarily in the smell, especially when it's got some head on it. Um And glue was more kind of like an undertone to the whole thing. It's got a bitter taste that, in my opinion, doesn't seem to really come from the hops so much as it does from the beer just being bad. And then um, the sour that you noted earlier, John, like it it is definitely sour, but it's not sour like a sour beer where it kind of makes you pucker. It's sour like, um, like an unripened peach. Like, it's just yeah, fucking yeah. bad, sour. Um, I did want to take a moment to... I found out why it is that it's called Shiny Diamonds. Um, first of all, it's made with crystal and strata hops. And then it was inspired by a song... I think the publisher was probably just stoned listening to uh, Rian, whoever. To Holy Diver by That's Dio. That's a great song. Dio, Ronnie Dio. James Dio. Oh, okay. So yeah, that's this that was song, the inspiration this for can, this. This beer cannot be cannot be inspired by Ronnie James Dio. Ronnie James Dio has one of the greatest voices in rock and roll, and this is shit. Maybe it is shit. He, your your childhood memories of him just contain a lot of nostalgia, and this was like the song. No, 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 no. Like no. I Can't like be. cannot be true. Cannot be true. <laughs> when this is over with, I'm going to play you some Ronnie James Dio just because it's important yeah. stuff. He was, the, he was the second lead singer to Black Sabbath. No, okay, I'm not going to okay, go into that. We'll do that later. Uh, you know what we didn't do last time before it cut out is we didn't do the, uh, the, the we didn't play our little game. Fuck date lawnmower. Fuck date lawnmower. Yeah. So um, who wants to go first on it? Let's go in order. Anna. No. Nope. Oh, hell no. If you were going to get laid before you had this beer, you were not getting laid after. Period. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I, I have a really hard time placing this one because normally this is a low enough beer that I would say um, now Anna's probably going to disagree with me on that but I'd say this is like the breakup date but honestly I don't think it falls quite to that level breakup with somebody who like you hate somebody who did you wrong so uh, you know I I I think there are much (coughs) better horrible beers out there I don't think it even even does the horrible beer category justice so I would love to kind of do a just a category of breakup beers like if if you want to fuck with the person that you're breaking up with if you two categories one if you like feel bad for them and you don't want them to hurt anymore there's this beer and the other one is like nah you fucked me over we're done yeah that, so, that so you, you know, the, the only thing that's coming to mind is uh, use this beer on a, on a date where you want a, a lot of, of uh, a really good outward appearance, 
but no substance. If you want a relationship with zero substance, this is probably the beer for you. Mm. Okay, okay, I can see that. Uh, as far as the lawnmower beer goes, I'll say it's light enough to be a lawnmower beer, but uh, I, I don't want to drink it while I'm on the lawnmower. Uh, I, I don't want to drink it. I think this would be really good under the lawnmower. Uh, <laughs> while, 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 while you're mowing. I would hate to damage my lawnmower with this beer. Okay, un- under somebody else's lawnmower. There you go. There you go. All right. So that uh, X that did you so wrong. Yeah. There you go. There you go. All right. So we're going to move over into uh, enlightened despotism now. Uh, and we've kind of seen absolutism as, uh, as as these these leaders that had absolute authority because they were selected by God. Okay. Well, now we're going to get into people that had absolute authority, but they had absolute authority based on reason. Okay. Um, the Enlightenment was this this massive movement where uh, where people started trying to put the rules of science and reason to everything, mm-hmm. and we had some really incredible leaders that came out of this. Uh, this is 18th century, and it's just this idea that society can be improved by the by the use of reason. Um, guys like like you know Louis the Fourteenth kind of starts to get there. Peter the Great starts to get there, but they don't. Fully make it. It's going to take those guys to come through and 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 push us over the over the level. Uh, some of the features of enlightened despotism, and I think I think y'all will have a little more more respect for these guys. Uh, they tended to have religious toleration. They tended to have freedom of speech and freedom of the press. Uh, citizens tended to have a right to own property. So they 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 they, they break down the the uh, the ideas of serfdom a lot of times. Um, Oftentimes, in fact, in most cases, they're supporters of the arts, they're supporters of science, they're supporters of literature, they're supporters of education. Um, and while they, the monarchs oftentimes do rule by birthright, <laughs> generally can. speaking, they come to power by birthright, but they retain their power constitutionally or through, through reason. Okay? So it's, you can see the change starting to happen. So it's, it's, it's this weird situation where, where we're going to allow these people to have absolute authority, but there's going to be a reason behind it besides just God said so. Okay? Does that make sense, everybody? Yeah. All right. So the first one I want to talk about with this one is Catherine the Great. Uh, when Peter the Great died, he had a – his son was, was – uh, well, his, his whole family was pretty much uh, incompetent to rule. In fact, Peter the Great ended up killing his own son later on uh, because he was so incompetent and not able to rule. Uh, so it's going to be two or three generations before somebody else comes up. And what you're going to end up with is uh, Peter the Third's wife, Catherine. Uh, Catherine was actually a German-born princess. Uh, she she ends up marrying the Tsar of of the Russias in a, an arranged marriage. It was a loveless marriage by all accounts. Uh, in fact, she, she she didn't seem to be able to stand Peter the Third. She had this whole series of, of affairs. Uh, Peter was was at, at least according to people at the time they accused him of being asexual, of not being interested in sex at all, mm-hmm. not being interested in love. All he he seemed to be one of, of that slow witted group of, of of the Tsar's family. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, Happens a lot in inbreeding. It, it does. Uh, he, he he was really more interested. They talked about how he would would spend time setting up battles with his toy soldiers, and and, and he didn't have the real soldiers. Oh, they he had finally toy got him soldiers, toys. But he would set up battles, and he he spent all this time playing with his toys. I wonder uh, if that's better or worse. And it, it but it drove it drove Catherine crazy. And when Peter dies, uh, very mysteriously, there's a lot of people that think that 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 he was he was murdered, probably by the boyers. In order to bring Catherine up, Catherine, this German princess, uh, takes the title of Tsarina, and she is actually able to do this. And she has gone down in history as Catherine the Great. Uh, why she didn't name herself that though? She is named that by a philosopher, a guy named Voltaire, who she had 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 extremely uh, uh, deep. Uh, uh, Thoughts with and, and, and letter writing campaigns and and Voltaire came and stayed at her palace and some even say that they were lovers at one point, mm-hmm. uh, but but she she spoke with the great philosophers of the time and could keep up with them in, mm-hmm. in discussions. So a very very brilliant person. Uh, she comes in and, and and reforms Russia. She opens hospitals. She opens schools. She supports the arts. Uh, 
She was also an expansionist. She expanded the Russian territory almost as much as Peter did. She's the one that finally uh, gets control of the Black Sea, which gives them a warm water port. Peter had controlled the, the North Sea, uh, the Arctic Circle. But those are cold water ports, and you can only use them in certain months of the year. She gets a Black Sea port, uh, which allows Russia to trade with, with the Mediterranean. Um, so Catherine the Great, the Empress of Russia, or Tsarina of Russia, uh, it, it is this uh, greatly loved leader. Uh, Again, she was she was a different kind of person. Lots of lovers, lots of uh, of, of of open discussion of this. Um, but it's bizarre to me that we got this German princess to do this, mm-hmm. and that it took that it took a foreigner to do this. It was something that a Russian couldn't do. Well, it some of that seems to kind of make sense, considering just how cut off they were from Western culture before. Well, and I guess it. What do you mean by do this? Because I'm I'm referring mostly to getting at control of the the Black Sea. Well, access. I was referring to the changes that she made, where she allowed private ownership of land, she allowed all this stuff, uh, uh, you know, freedom of speech. This is stuff that Peter never would have allowed mm-hmm. ever. Uh, it's a big change, and she, <coughs> the reason she was able to do this while she was feared, believe me, she was she was a terrifying woman whenever you made her angry. The reason she was able to consolidate power was because the people loved her, because Mm -hmm. she did for them. She did so much for the people. That's why she's remembered so well today. Right. Uh, So why did that take a Why did it take – yeah, why did it – why couldn't a Russian have done this? And uh, I think you hit it on the nail with with, with you needed somebody that wasn't insulated. Yeah. And – and, and she comes from, from the German states, which had experienced the Renaissance and mm-hmm. had experienced this stuff when Russia hadn't. Right. Um, yeah, it's hard to see value in things you have no um, no experience with. Yeah, well, and, and I would even, even question the legitimacy of the question. Uh, you know, the, the question was, why couldn't a Russian have done this? And... Was it that a Russian could have done it, or none of the Russians did it? Or that that particular Russian family couldn't, and they happened to be the ones who had the power? Yeah, I, I think there probably was somebody, but, but a Russian didn't do it. That's probably right. a better yeah. thing. And, yeah. and, and I, think it's, I think it was harder for a Russian to do it because of, because of experiences. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so bringing somebody in from outside. And it's bizarre to me as a historian to think that the Russian people were so accepting of a German princess. Mm-hmm. Um, and the other side of that is, could she have done it if her husband hadn't been an imbecile? Yeah. And, I, and I'm using yeah. that in the classical sense, literally uh, a, a, a slow-witted mm-hmm. individual. Um, and, and all evidence is that, that he was. Um, well, and I, I think that you characterized it really well. I think if she had come in and, and been tyrannical and um, and – done terrible things and and the general experience of the people in Russia was that she was bad for their way of life that they wouldn't have been so accepting of her but well, I, I agree now she, yeah. she 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 was she was dangerous. she was willing to go to war she did go yeah. to war against Frederick the Great she did go to war against Joseph the second of Austria she 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 you know she did invade Poland and and, 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 and have part of the partitioning she yeah. was not Today, we would not call her a good person. Right. But for the time period, very enlightened. Yeah. Well, and I guess what I'm referring to more is um, because war, while it is going to have a life and death impact on a lot of people, um, you know, we're looking more at, at, or what I'm looking at more is the day-to-day lives of of the people not at war. Um <coughs> You know, and and invasive war is war where you're invaded is much different than war where your country is invading. Yeah, and it's a much different experience for the people. The the the, the next one, and, and all three of these that I'm going to deal with exist at the same time. Okay, so you had Catherine the Great in Russia. Mm-hmm. Over in Prussia, which was the largest of the German states, you had Frederick the Great. Uh, 
uh, and he probably did name himself. Mm -hmm. uh, Frederick the Great was a was a Prussian prince. Uh, and if you want to know where Prussia is, it's the it's basically the modern states of Germany and Poland. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, not all of Germany, but 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 most of modern Germany and and Poland. That's where I'm um, from. Uh, uh, my wife too. Uh, I thought you were from Jacksonville. That's where my, my I thought you was a Yankee. people way back. Um, shut up. You too now. Yeah, definitely, a Yankee. absolutely, definitely a Yankee. Uh, so. Frederick the Great uh, comes to power, and he, he's going to be influenced by by the Enlightenment, though not to the degree that um, uh, that Catherine is. Uh, he's going to allow freedom of the press. He's going to allow religious toleration, although not religious freedom. Uh, but the difference between that is there was a state religion, mm -hmm. but you could practice other religions if you paid a tax. So he's going to tolerate you, but not give you freedom. Does that make sense? Um, the, so the, uh, okay. Yeah, I, I think I've heard of this for uh, freedom isn't free is what they say. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's, it's it, you know, but but it, but it's a step in the right direction. He gets rid yeah. of the state church that you had to be belong to. Uh, you now get now killed? yeah now now you know you can be another religion, but this is still the official religion of the state. Uh, so, uh, but but his big thing is that he outlawed torture. And that's hmm. going to be a be a, a big change, uh, especially when you've got got Frederick the Great, who was known as the greatest military mind at the time. Uh, Frederick the Great ends up uh, he, he wins almost every battle. Now he loses the most important one against Gustav of Sweden. Uh, but Frederick the Great is going to be be somebody that 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 while he has absolute power, he is going to respect his people enough to allow them. A degree of religious toleration, a degree of, of freedom of, of speech. Uh, they can own property, although there is still there is still serfdom there. Uh, the, his cousin, the King of Austria, Joseph II, is going to be the most enlightened of them all, and and also the most ineffective, uh, hmm. w w which I find, I, you know, I kind of want to talk about that as we go through there. Uh, is, is there a degree of ineffectiveness that happens as you lose some of this absolutism? Okay, and you're losing efficiency. Uh, he did outlaw torture. He also outlawed the death penalty. So that's that's two weapons that that, that he takes away from, even from himself. Uh, he allowed religious freedom, uh, freedom of the press. He limited the power of the pope in in um, in, in Austria. The the pope was. He was recognized as the religious leader, but mm -hmm. he no longer had the authority, to uh, any secular authority. He couldn't even appoint the bishops in Austria. The bishops were appointed by the state, and the pope could recognize them. Mm -hmm. But the idea here is, is, is no, you're, you're not going to do this, because a lot of those bishops also had secular powers. Mm -hmm. um, he uh, reduced the power of the lords. He abolished his serfdom. And this is the guy that make that that organizes the first partitioning of Poland. Under Joseph, Poland is going to disappear. Frederick, Joseph, and Catherine are just going to carve Poland up, and it's going to completely disappear underneath this guy. Um, but again, this guy is not not anywhere near as effective. Austria doesn't expand like the others do. Mm -hmm. uh, he he he's he's very much a thinking man and wanting to do things for people, but he's not able to to, to consolidate power nearly as well. Well, well, and I, and I kind of take issue with that that classification. Uh, not that necessarily it, it's not that it's necessarily wrong, but I, I think we have to measure people against the standard of their own goals. If we call rabbits completely ineffective because they don't swim well. I, I, well, I, I think that that you know people kind of would look at you sideways of they're not trying well, to well, swim. Well, well, I, I think you're right, but whenever I say that he's ineffective or inefficient, the government did not grow underneath him. The economy did not grow, and the people that came after them didn't even have a power. He, he his, his family's going to get overthrown afterwards. But couldn't you say the same thing about the American Re Revolution? Sure. The government didn't grow. It shrank completely. It was a completely well, ineffective I, revolution. No, I think it was... I think the American Revolution was effective. The King of England was ineffective. But but if you're talking solely about governmental growth... Well, I, I, I'm, I'm talking about... Okay, I, 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 in this case, I am. Yeah. In this case, I'm talking about the eff efficient and effectiveness of government. I don't think he was trying to shrink government. I think he was trying to work with the people and keep power. He wasn't able to do both. 
Um, well, if 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 that, now I could be wrong there. Yeah, if if that's what he's trying to do, then then you know, maybe he he definitely he definitely might have failed at his goal of keeping power. However, when I hear this, and and you have much more background yep. on this, um, and hear that he is taking tools away from government, <laughs> it seems like there's some deeper kind <laughs> of conviction there on his. <laughs> On what he's trying to do than just... My goodness, yeah, are you I'm okay? Yeah. Than just maintain or grow the, the power of the state. It seems like he, he sees maybe a better society. Whether he's he's right or not, I think history has shown he well, was, but... I, 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 I think you're right to the extent that he, that he wanted the... Um, you know, he wanted the people to have more power. But one of his goals was to expand his nation and create a... You know, conquer his enemies and create... A, a more spread his ideas Republican idea elsewhere. Mm-hmm. He wasn't able to do that. I think history would 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 show that wrong. Well, he didn't do that. It wasn't him that did it. So, yeah. so I think his ideas spread to an extent, but it wasn't him that did it. Okay. So uh, you know, it, well, and I think you have to look at did he do it in the way that he attempted to do it. Well, and, and then the other thing is, if you completely wipe him out of history, did it does the anyway? idea spread just as fast? Whether it's just through other writings or people maybe, looking at this as a, maybe you know maybe I think Catherine probably did more than than he did for for okay. spreading the idea, but uh, uh, but but I think he again he was he was much more interested in being a a thinking man than he was anything else, uh, and and was usually seen as a pretty weak monarch by by the rest of the world. Uh, although he still you know he still claimed to be the absolute monarch, he still mm-hmm. claimed to have all these powers. He used them to grant other people powers. Yeah, um, well, and it would seem that on a whim, if he had decided that that wasn't the way to go anymore, he could have reinstituted all those things, yeah, taken he, those freedoms away. he probably away. could have tried. Uh, we, we found that it's hard to put the right. rabbit back in the hat, but yeah. uh, it, you know that's kind of how it works. And, and I guess by that, I mean, would have had the authority to take those back. Now, whether or not it worked and whether or not his people rose up against him for taking that back is a whole different thing, but not that he gave up the authority yeah, yeah. to do so. All right. The the next little section I want to talk about is the, the next evolution. So we've gone from, from your absolute monarchs to your enlightened despots. Now I want to talk about constitutional monarchy. This was entirely an accident. Okay. <laughs> the idea of a constitutional monarchy is something that was, that was largely not supposed to happen. And it's going to rise up in in the British Isles in England. Uh, when Elizabeth dies, Elizabeth dies with no heir. Uh, she never married. She had no heir. Uh, not that you have to be married to have an heir, but 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 she never she never had a child. So on her deathbed, they said, "Who who who should we, you know, who should take your place?" And she handpicks her successor, my cousin James the Sixth of Scotland, mm-hmm. should become King of England. So James the Sixth, King of Scotland, becomes James the First, King of England, um, and consolidates the empire. James was very much an old school, absolute monarchy. He brings in the idea of the Stuarts. Uh, by the way, this is the King James of the Bible that uh, right. they commissioned the King James Bible, um, and he comes in and tries to to instill this this all powerful leadership, but. England doesn't have that tradition. England has the tradition of of having to deal with parliaments, and parliament will have have none of this. Parliament's not willing to give up this. Uh, James is able to consolidate power a little bit. Uh, he's able to 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 kind of create a theocracy. We we, we know what he did there with with uh, Protestantism, but when James dies, his son Charles becomes becomes king, and Charles is completely incapable of doing this. He tries to raise taxes and Parliament rises up against him and the English Civil War breaks out. And what you have are the roundheads against uh, 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 my, against the Cavaliers in this time period. The roundheads supported Parliament and the Cavaliers supported the King. So you had a civil war where both sides had raised an army and they fought against each other. Parliament wins the battle and they put Oliver Cromwell on the throne as Lord Protector. They dissolved the idea of a king completely. Mm-hmm. All they had was a lord protector, which was like the leader of parliament. The leader of parliament uh, is going to run things. Uh, 
Cromwell is going to uh, uh, kind of act like a king. He's going to be kind of abusive of his powers, uh, but but he's going to be able to to, to, to to rule pretty effectively after the Civil War. When he dies, his son briefly takes over. He's incompetent, and England yearns for the day of a, of a king. So what do they do? They go and they invite back a king and queen. They go find William and Mary. William of Orange, who's a French prince, and Mary, who is the, the rightful ruler under the under the dynasty of... Former uh, school teachers, right? <laughs> shut up. <laughs> so William and Mary come back. Um, and in 1688, we have the Glorious Revolution, where without firing a shot, they land in England. They are crowned king and queen of, of England, but they're forced to sign a constitutional document limiting their power. And from this point forward, England is going to have a king and queen that is no longer going to be absolute. They're going to act as head of state, but all of their powers are going to be checked by Congress or by, by, by Parliament. Okay, uh, and and that that's the system we have today. So we've seen the development of monarchies as it's moved through each one of these systems, and we've kind of seen it in three different systems. So I guess the you know we go back to our, our initial question here that we had of um, let me go back and find what I put what is the value of absolutism is is absolutism effective and efficient or is the modern system you know of constitutional monarchy or democracy more effective and efficient I think the the real easy answer to that question is the value of the monarchy was it led to the more efficient and better systems we have today, it evolved into. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna play devil's advocate <laughs> with you a little bit because while it did do that, think about what nations do in times of extreme conflict and and, and extreme danger. They throw out those checks and they, they 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 put absolutism in the hands of a small group of people to be more efficient. Mm-hmm. Which makes me wonder if the modern system is, in fact, more effective and efficient. Well, and and so um, I I could argue the effectiveness of doing so. I could even uh, argue real danger in a modern world. But without going into any of that, here's what I'll argue. Our system has a flexibility to be their system. Theirs doesn't have the flexibility of our system. That's a good so point. So we get to eat, have our cake and eat it too if you do want to argue that. that yeah. That's a good point. Well, and um, I, I lost my train of thought. Never mind. I have long argued that there is no system of government more efficient than a monarchy. I, I think it is by far the most efficient form of government. And if you have a benevolent monarch that is a good that is good at what they do, you have a system of government that works incredibly well. The danger is what happens when you don't have that person. Yeah. Okay. Now that's not an argument saying that I support monarchy. Mm-hmm. I don't. I don't support absolutism. But I think from any statistical look at look, look at the facts, you have to argue that it is more efficient. Well, and and I remembered. My, my thought now. Um, but the argument I was going to make is, again, it depends on what you mean by efficient and effective. Um, I think that the more modern systems are less prone to great shifts in, in how things are run. Um, and that shit throws a society into chaos. It does. Um, so if if you're saying effective as far as getting things done, yes, there are way more roadblocks in um, in a system like what we have today, um, you know, like parliamentary systems, anything like that. But you see a lot less drastic change um, than you do whenever one person has absolute control. And then they die, there's a successor who has totally different ideas, or just goes off on a rampage one day. Um, so I think that if you're effective, if you're, the effectiveness that you're trying to reach is having a society that can grow and develop at a steady rate, then I think the more modern systems are more effective. Okay, that's fair enough. That's fair enough. 
Well, this has been a lot of fun, guys. I, I know it's a little different kind of podcast than we've done uh, in a while. I, I enjoy the history side of it, but it's, you know, try to look at the philosophy while we're doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, this was this was a lot of fun for me to look at and, and, and do. I haven't taught this subject in a while, so it mm-hmm. took me a while to, to, to get through this. Yeah. Um, I, I do want to come in and apologize to any of our viewers. Uh, we had technical difficulties today, as as you see. We did, we did during the show. But but last week we had a bit of of technical difficulty as well. Um, if you're watching the video, I'm gonna try and clean it up so maybe it's not as bad when it gets to you guys. But like my paper that was sent on the edge was almost glowing, and my shirt was glowing. Um, what what happened was we upgraded our equipment. We got a new camera. I had an X-ray back there yeah. that just like it, it got damaged. I thought totally. it was our brilliant personalities yeah. that were glowing. I was, I, was, I was the only one glowing, so no, probably never mind. Yeah. Probably exactly what happened. Never mind. Um, but radiation. We, yeah, yeah. We 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 got an we got some upgraded equipment um, in order to do that. Uh, hopefully, our video is looking sharper. I think it is, and and we're going to continue to improve. Uh, but I want to send a special thank you out uh, to our patrons. Mm-hmm. Because it's those guys that let us make these these improvements. Yes, thank you, thank uh, you. And there's much more that we could be doing. Mm-hmm. So if you would like to support us, please go to patreon.com slash six pack philosophy. Sign up. There are various levels with different perks. You can watch the, the live stream so you can see what we were talking about during the, the breakdown. It was kind of funny. And there is a value that, that, that will meet your needs. What, yes. Whatever your need yeah. is, there is a level that you can do it at. Absolutely. And uh, you can also help us make the show better. So when you just watch us on YouTube or, or check us out in your podcatchers, you'll get more quality out of your content right. as well as better content because we will have more time when we're not fidgeting with equipment because we have the right equipment. Yeah. And if we make enough money that we can quit our jobs and just do this, you'll also get an ass load more comment. There you go. Con- there you content. Go. Yeah. yeah. And I won't do things like that. No, that's not yes, true. You will. I yes, will. you will. Yes, I'll you will. Totally we'll do always that. do that. Right. Hey, for the recommendation today, I'm going to do something a little bit different. Uh, oh, shit, instead of just recommending a podcast, mm-hmm. I'm going to recommend an app for everybody. Uh, mm-hmm. There's actually a great courses app out there now. Oh, really? Where you can download this and there's a bunch of free great courses on it that you can do. You can also subscribe and get all the great courses if you want to or buy them individually, whatever you like. But it is so awesome to be able to go on here and and just I can find lectures by the greatest minds on whatever I want and listen to them. And some of them are so elaborate. Yeah. So uh, if you're like me or, or anybody in this show and are, and are lifelong learners that just want to learn all the time, this is a this is a great app. I'm going to put the, the link to that app. I don't do you have it on, on iPhone, right? I do. I think they probably have one for both iPhone and Android. I'll put whatever links I have in the description. Also, I'm like 98% sure without having it in front of me that they have a YouTube channel. I'll put that at, at yeah, our end do. screen. They do. They do. And you can go check out their YouTube as well. Great course is just a great thing to they are awesome. check out. They are awesome. I just so, downloaded it. Yeah. So uh, this was a ton of fun. Thank you all for listening. And uh, I think that closes us up for the day, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. We've had a good time. We hope you have too. Cheers. 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 Six Pack Philosophy is supported by independent philosophers just like you. If you would like to support us, go to sixpackphilosophy.com and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. 